Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we begin with a big jump in the number of fatalities related to the coronavirus tonight as Metro Health reports 53 deaths. According to the city, these deaths happened between July 6th and the 24th, not since yesterday. 27 women between the ages of 37 and 99 have died and 26 men between the ages of 48 and 91. More than half had underlying medical conditions. This does not include the number of deaths since yesterday. We expect to hear more about this from Mayor Ron Nuremberg coming up in our daily update about 13 minutes away. The recent hacking of a Zoom court hearing with the injection of profanity and obscene material has prompted a call for a closer look at how remote legal proceedings are being conducted. Paul Venable with more on whether the protocols in place worked and the investigation into the latest case of what's being called Zoom bombing. At this time, the court is going to call cause number six. Zoom proceedings are no different in one basic way from any other court proceeding. There is a constitutional requirement that all judicial proceedings must be open to the public. That means proceeding with caution when it's a Zoom hearing since there are new elements in play. And hacking will always be a threat. In a way, it's a little scary because being open to the public, we want to make sure that we protect certain passwords, make sure that certain parts of our system is operating with cert certain levels of privacy. That means quickly changing access credentials as the judge did last week. Zoom bombing is the equivalent of contempt of court during a live trial or hearing. But instead of being removed from the courtroom by a bailiff during the Zoom hearing, the judge shuts them down electronically. There is an investigation underway to find out uh, the individual or individuals involved in this. They're gonna investigate this case to its conclusion and that they will eventually follow a case against whoever it was that Zoom bombed this situation. A conviction could mean a $500 fine, six months in jail, or both. Paul Venom on Case at 12 News. New at 6, high school football workouts already underway. Social distancing easier said than done, say health experts, especially once the season begins. Smaller schools kick off later this month, larger schools in late September. Along with the Texas heat and injuries, Jesse DeGollado says young players now face the added risk of COVID-19. Young athletes who yearn to be back on the field for football practice are making the most of it. Yet even when games resume, they'll have to follow UIL health and safety protocols. According to UT Health, only one in five healthy young people risk serious COVID-19 complications. But it's impossible to be certain uh, that a healthy person that's an athlete is not going to get a serious COVID-19 infection. He says not only those with compromised immune systems, chronic illness, or undergoing cancer treatment could wind up in intensive care and possibly risk the kind of long-term effects that adults are suffering irreversible damage to the lungs and in some situations uh, heart and the kidney damage. Young athletes and their parents, he says, should know based on cases among children and adolescents, the risk is very real. There is absolutely no guarantee, despite the low relative risk, though they may feel very, very healthy. Much like he did playing for Roosevelt High School in the 60s. At this age, he says, they may not grasp the severity of the disease. And so I think my judgment would not have been nearly as good then as it is now. Jesse DeGollado, KSAT 12 News. Well, it is about to be a school year like no other. After some back and forth decisions and state directives, most districts are beginning the year with online learning and teachers having to adapt, like Emily McAtenick. She's a first grade teacher at Tuscany Heights Elementary School in the Northeast ISD. She gave us a sneak peek at her classroom in the era of COVID. We have all but one teacher that is physically teaching from their classroom. And then on every grade level, there's one to two teachers that will stay virtual the entire year. So myself, when it's safe, I will have physical students as well as two other first grade teachers. And then the other two will remain virtual for the entire school year. She's taken out tables and rugs that used to be for group activities in preparation for when her students are allowed to return in person to class. She'll meet her students and parents this Thursday for 10 minutes to get them ready for virtual learning. 
And a lot of things will be different about the upcoming school year, whether it is school, in classroom or online. And we're going to talk about all of that in a virtual town hall. We're calling learning in a pandemic. It's coming up at the bottom of this hour. We'll begin on air and online at 630 tonight. We will go until 8 o'clock. We have school district superintendents, members of the mayor's school task force here to answer your questions. There was also a live chat feature here where you can be part of the conversation. You can get your questions in right now. Submit them. We'll ask them at KSAT.com. The city of San Antonio expects to spend close to half a billion dollars on coronavirus related expenses over three years. In a budget presentation today, city staff told council members they expect to spend $492 million on the response and recovery from COVID-19 through the end of the 2022 fiscal year. The tally covers everything from testing costs to the city's emergency housing assistance program, which continues to quickly run through the $50.3 million it's set aside so far. We are receiving anywhere from 150 to 200 applications per day and expending approximately $2.5 million in funds per week. Most of that money comes from grants, though more than 94 million will come out of the city's general fund. The 492 million does not include the plan the city is currently considering to use sales tax dollars for a workforce development program. A man in custody after a wild chase, mostly on the city's south side today. A lot of this played out live right here on KSAT 12 on TV this afternoon. Sky 12 over it all as that suspect zoomed over interstate interstates through residential streets, trying to get away from Bear County deputies and state troopers. The sheriff's office tells us it all started on Highway 16 in Twin Valley with a call for a reckless driver who reportedly hit a big rig, then a minor crash with a patrol unit near Loop 410. The driver took out two gates at a Benz at Benz Engelman and I-35. Then it all went back south along 35 in and out of traffic down major streets through neighborhoods. Deputies backed off. Troopers picked up the pursuit. Ultimately, the suspect bailed out of his rapidly failing car and made a run for it in the 1300 block of West Hutchins. That didn't work out too well for him, though. Troopers moved in and took him down. Put the handcuffs on him. He is now facing several charges. That's the moment it happened there. Those charges evading arrest and possession of a controlled substance among the list. San Antonio police arresting a man they say broke into a convenience store for cigarettes and he may have done it several times. Jacob Alvarez has been charged with burglary. According to police, surveillance video shows someone matching Alvarez's description using a rock to break a window at a Circle K, then helping himself to cigarettes. A little while later, police say they found Alvarez hiding under a car not too far away. Police say that same business has been hit in that exact same way several times. Investigators believe Alvarez is responsible for those break-ins as well. It's been a month since a man was hit and killed by a car on the near south side. San Antonio police are still looking for the driver of that car that hit and killed him. It happened back on July 11th, late that Saturday night. According to police, 21 year old Antonio Lopez crossing the street near South Florida Street and Division Avenue when he was struck by a car. Officers say the driver took off. Lopez died at the scene. Investigators believe the suspect's vehicle is a sedan with dark tinted windows. Information that leads to an arrest could be worth up to $5,000 from Crime Stoppers. The number to call 210-224-STOP. Time saver traffic now. Let's head to the downtown area. This is I-35 at Brooklyn. You're looking at the upper level here. You could see in both directions traffic moving pretty smoothly and pretty light for 6 o'clock. And live cam tonight. Well, you know, just another 100 degree day in paradise. <laughs> Let's look at it that way, shall we? 100 <laughs> degrees paradise. You know, a lot of people love the heat. True. Even the intense heat. So this is your time of year. Savor it because we are in the thick of it. The aquifer, though, it does not like this kind of weather. It is down 1.1 feet. It took a big hit today to 656.7, and now we're 1.2 feet below the August average. Just one allergen reported today, mold, and it's low at 450. Castroville is 102 now, Divine 103, 102 in New Braunfels, 94 meanwhile, Canyon Lake, 99 Stinson, and Bernie at 93. And Del Rio is a little bit hotter at 104. So yes, another triple digit day today. More of the same as we go into tomorrow. You know, one thing this weather pattern is good for, 
viewing the Perseid meteor shower, which peaks late tonight and early tomorrow morning. If you head outside, really the best viewing is from 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. And you look off to the northeast, especially if you're getting out there before 2 a.m. Look off to the northeast. If it's anytime after 2 a.m., just look straight up. Give yourself time to your eyes to adjust, be patient. And if you're in an ideal situation in a perfect spot with very little light pollution, you could see up to 30 meteors per hour, but that's the exception rather than the norm. And we will have the moon rising as well, so that's going to interfere with the viewing a bit. 79 tomorrow morning, 93 at noon, then 101 for the high temperature. A little bit of cloud cover early, otherwise a lot of sunshine tomorrow. And tomorrow is another CPS Energy peak demand day. So we suggest reducing your usage of energy from 3 to 7 p.m. More on the seven day forecast and tropical depression 11 coming right coming right up. We told you off the top of the show that we are expecting an unusually high amount of deaths to reported to be reported during today's briefing at least 53 that date back into July. And then we'll see whatever numbers they have from the last 24 hours. We're expecting to hear from Mayor Ron Nuremberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf momentarily. There they are. Let's go live. Metro Health Director, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Today we're reporting 205 cases of COVID-19 new to our community, which brings our total to 43,164. That pushes our seven-day average up slightly to 266 new cases per day. We have 11 new deaths to report, unfortunately, tonight as well. Five Hispanic males, one in his 30s, the others in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Three white males in their 60s and 70s, and three Hispanic females in their 60s and 80s. Metro Health, as we've been talking about, has been working to uh, validate deaths reported by the state through death certificates over the, the course of the months. And so we also wanted to confirm an additional 53 deaths that were part of the state's count based on the information provided on those death certificates sent to the state. These deaths occurred between July 1st and 21st, and Metro Health has investigated now and validated them as COVID-19 related. So between the 11 new deaths reported today and the 53 validated deaths from July, the new total is 519 deaths in our community since this began. 265 deaths from the state's count are currently under investigation by Metro Health. And as we talked about yesterday, both of those uh, numbers will be reported daily on our website so you can track the number of deaths that have been investigated and validated and confirmed here in the local community as well as those that are pending investigation as reported from the state. Now over to our hospitals. Tonight we're reporting 720 people in the hospital. That's down five from yesterday. We had an uptick in admissions tonight and 62 new admissions to the hospital. If you remember 49 from the last few days, it was up to 62 today. 317 are in the ICU and 216 on ventilators. 48% 40, of ventilators available and 16% of staff hospital beds available in our system. Do want to report that for the first time in a month, the stress in our hospital has started to ease up slightly. It's now in the orange, which means that the risk level, uh, the, the severity level in our community hospital system has been reduced from severe to high, but it's right on the edge of severe. So again, we're maintaining all these precautions. Let's look at the indicators guiding our recommendations regarding students returning to the classroom. We're watching three things, declining new cases, and we wanna see that sustained 14-day decline, positivity rate, as well as how long it takes for the number of cases in our community to double. Only one of these three metrics so far is where we want them to be, so we do remain in the red zone, high risk for students to return to the classroom, and therefore Metro Health continues to recommend remote learning at this time. Let me turn it over to Bear County Judge Nelson yeah, Wolf. Thanks, and uh, things continue to look better, but going at a pretty slow pace, and so we've really got to continue to be uh, careful. Uh, I've been getting a few lessons here lately on my uh, bandana. Number one, I want you to know it's double. I want you to know it's tripled and quadrupled right in here, but it's still not as good as a cone face mask. So I guess it's about two weeks ago, uh, my uh, daughter-in-law, Molly, her, her mother, uh, Kathy Gwynn, sent me this. Now, that's kind of what uh, 
Bridget had down there, so it does cover you better, and there's no doubt that it's better, but um, it's because it's got that filter in there, and that filter in there makes a big, big difference. Uh, PM 2.5, I think. it. Uh, so if you want to get the best, I think the base vary from 20 to 25, $25, maybe a little bit more depending on which one you get. I don't know that this cotton is really any better than my cotton, but to do the best, do this. So my view is if you're going to be around a lot of people, probably wear the safer one. If you're just going to be in a smaller setting, maybe maybe the uh, uh, cloth or the other is okay. So I'm adjusting myself a little bit to these new studies. Uh, you know, it's some interesting, a lot of this, uh, every time I turn around, I'm reading some new study and we're finding out a little bit more and many times we find out we know less than what we thought we knew before. But uh, it's interesting when you look at people with, uh, with uh, no symptoms, asymptomatic, I probably would be one of those. Well, I am one of those. In fact, I had a test the other day and it was negative. But, you know, you could have it. And you wonder, why don't I ever get sick? I'm 80 years old. Well, 80 years old, I'll be 80 years old in October. Why do I not get sick? How come, how come I'm okay and other people are maybe not okay? Well, they're trying to come up with a lot of different answers. A partial immunity that I might have might be my genetics. I have strong genes, you know, and maybe that's why. Or there may be some memory uh, T cells in there that are part of my immune system that recognizes when I got an invasion and it stops it. Or I'm, if I had an infection and didn't know it and maybe my antibodies now are protecting me. But... We don't know for sure um, uh, why so many of us are healthy and may have, may have got it. Uh, I guess uh, uh, we're fortunate to be that way. But we still have to remember, even though we're that way, we still can transmit it if we, if we had it and didn't know it. And that's why uh, I'm getting the lectures on what's the best way to, uh, what face mask is the best to, best to use. So. All right, a, a mask lesson there from uh, Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf talking about the best ones to use and that maybe a mask is better than the bandana he's been wearing. Uh, but the big number uh, that we talked about off the top of the show, uh, the number of deaths that were confirmed today, there were 53 confirmed from July. Add that to 11 new deaths today, and the new total is 519. There still remains 265 deaths under investigation by Metro Health. We'll hopefully get some clarification on those numbers later. However, we have 205 new cases are reported over the last 24 hour period. Some good news that hospitalization number continues to tick downward. 720 people hospitalized right now and the risk to our hospital system, we heard the mayor say, has now gone down from severe too high. So yeah. it's not an incredible improvement, but it is something. Uh, he did say that we are still at a very high risk with our hospital system, but the hospital capacity is at 16%. And just as a reminder, that is the percentage of locally staffed hospital beds. So beds that are available and are able to have staff tend to them. 16% of those are available. All right, let's switch over to weather right now. Adam Kasky standing by to talk about just how hot it's going to be over the next few days, Adam. It is going to be. Something about Annie Oakley's gun. <laughs> That's what Grandpa used to always say. He used to always say, uh, the late Robert O'Brien, you say, oh, it's hotter than Annie Oakley's pistol outside. Now, in St. Paul, Minnesota, that was, what, 85 degrees? <laughs> Here, 100, yeah, it's about that. Uh, so we're at the century mark exactly. That was our high so far today. 66 degrees is our dew point, so it feels like it's 4 degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. Tomorrow morning at sunrise, we'll be in the upper 70s for most of us. 80 degrees in Del Rio, 77 Carrizo Springs and New Braunfels and Pleasant in 78. Then by the afternoon, we just do this all over again and get used to it through the weekend thereafter. We're sensing a little pattern shift, but tomorrow afternoon, 98 Beeville, 101 Pleasanton, and Hondo right at the century mark. Stone Oak about 99 tomorrow afternoon, Bernie 96, 97 along with Leon Springs, but Lackland, Von Army, Elmendorf, all 100 along with Castroville, and even Rio Medina included there. All right, taking a look at our satellite and radar, nothing but clear skies, good viewing for the Perseid meteor shower later on tonight. Again, that peaks later tonight. Look off to the northeast if you're trying to view it before 2 a.m. and get away from 
all kinds of city lights that you can. High pressure is in charge, but that's going to be moving westward, and that's going to shift our pattern by this time next week. So we anticipate a few subtle changes at that point. Tropical Depression 11, way out into the Atlantic, likely to become Tropical Storm Josephine in the days ahead. And by Sunday, it could be somewhere near or just north of Puerto Rico. Otherwise, some morning clouds tomorrow, then a lot of sunshine just like today, starting at 79, making it up to 100. KSAT Power Saver Day tomorrow. Turn up that thermostat two degrees. Don't do the laundry in the afternoon. You have an excuse to save some power during the peak of energy demand. And then next week, maybe a few isolated showers Monday, Tuesday, and back into the upper 90s. All right. Thank you, Adam. Sports is up next. The Rockets' James Harden sitting this one out against the Spurs today because he doesn't like what he sees. Houston up by five early, but DeMar DeRozan, the drive and the spin in the lane for the left-handed finish to give the Spurs their first lead of the game. Keldon Johnson grabs the Drew Eubanks miss, then he goes back up strong to help San Antonio out to a six-point lead. Lonnie Walker had ten big points in the second quarter. First the three from the wing, and then the lead grows to 19. A minute later, Walker's driving the lane, takes the contact, gets it to fall, the Spurs are up by 21. Spurs got contributions from everybody. Seven players in double figures this afternoon. Marco Bellinelli for three was 13 right there. Then Rudy Gay in the final seconds of the third drains a three. He had 13 and the Spurs were up by 20 going into the fourth quarter. The Wild Mustang, as Pop calls Keldon, had a career game going baseline with the bucket and the foul. Then knocking down his third three of the game, he finished with a career best 24 points, 11 boards in the 123 to 105 route of the Rockets to keep their postseason hopes alive. He's a high energy guy. Uh, very physical, uh, very competitive, very coachable. Uh, he's he's just a winner. Oh, he's a horse. He he continues to work hard offensively and defensively. Um, you know, he's always attacking the rim. Um, he's a lot bigger than a lot of people think he is. So um, it, it's great to see everything turning out the way that it should for him. All right, the Spurs have one more game in the bubble so far against Utah on Thursday at 530. They're going to need some help even if they win against Utah from either Phoenix or Portland. As expected, the Big Ten has become the first Power Five conference to announce that they are postponing the fall football season with the hopes of playing in the spring. The Pac-12 follows shortly thereafter with the same action. The announcement comes after several days of speculation and reports amid the health concerns revolving around the coronavirus. And it comes despite pleas from players, coaches, and even the president of the United States to let them play. This also comes after his Many as five players in the Big Ten were diagnosed with that rare disease known as myocarditis, which is the enlargement of the heart muscle believed to be accelerated by COVID-19. When you look at this decision, uh, it just we just believe collectively there's too much uncertainty at this point in time uh, in, in our country and to, to really to encourage our student athletes to participate in fall sports. And the Big 12 is meeting as we speak. Our big game previews take us to Wimmerley, where the Texans are ranked in the top five at number four in Class 4A Division II in the state, according to Texas Football Magazine. That's after the Texans made it all the way to the state finals, where they lost to Texarkana Pleasant Grove 35-21, finishing 12-4 overall. Head coach Doug Warren welcomes back 14 starters for the team with six on offense, eight on defense, including running back Moses Ray, who rushed for over 1,200 yards, scoring 15 touchdowns, and wide receiver slash defensive back Christian Marshall had over 30 1,300 yards receiving, 18 touchdowns to go along with his five interceptions on defense. Third class to get to state, that was big for us. Getting that far, it was unbelievable. And I would do anything to get back to it this year. You have to use that as a springboard. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of success last year, like I said, played in the state finals, came up a little bit short there. So there's some extra motivation. You know, but it is a different team. We've had some key losses and, and just trying to find some young guys that are going to fill into those spots and, and uh, you know, carve out their, their uh, legacy. The Texans will kick out their season at home against Canyon Lake on Friday, August the 28th at 7.30 p.m. And as we told you earlier, we'll keep tabs on what the Big 12 is doing as we speak. We expect the meetings to go on most of the night. We may have a decision by at least 10 o'clock tonight on the night, Pete. A lot of ripple effects out there, that's for sure. Big time. Thank you, Greg. All right, we have moved into our newsroom set. We are about to kick off our town hall learning during a pandemic. We're taking your questions, getting your answers when we come back. 
Martinez. He has been with SAISD since 2015. He's with the COVID-19 Economic Transition Team. In July 2020, the Carnegie Corporation of New York named him to their annual list of great immigrants and great Americans for his leadership during the pandemic. He, SAISD serves about 49,000 students. Also joined by Dr. Brian Woods from the North in Northside Independent School District. He's been the superintendent since 2012, began his career at the Northside in 1992. He's been an assistant principal, vice principal, principal, assistant superintendent. He has a son that attends NISD, and he's the president-elect of the Texas Association of School Administrators. NISD is, the South, is South Texas' largest school systems. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight. Right off the top, what is the message that you want parents to get tonight from this town hall? I'll start with you, Mr. Martinez. You know, first of all, that all of our decisions are going to be driven by medical data, that we are going to honor parents' choices. So for our parents who want to stay remote, uh, whether it's the first nine weeks, all semester, all year long, they will have that option. But all decisions we made based on medical information we're getting through Metro Health. So I, I want our families to know that safety will be our priority and it won't, there won't be any arbitrary deadlines or dates. It will be driven by what's best for our children and how do we ensure that, that they are safe in our schools. Dr. Woods? I'll just, I, I, I agree with uh, Superintendent Martinez on that response. That's true for us as well. I, I, I would add that, um, that I think what parents are gonna see, whether their children are uh, virtual learners or in-person learners will be obviously different than uh, the spring. I think uh, we, we all feel like we've stood up systems that will enable us to mimic the rigor of in-person learning in a virtual setting. Uh, and then obviously for those who are in our buildings, once we feel like it's safe for folks to, to join us in the buildings, um, it will, uh, we will be following the, the kinds of practices that we've all gotten used to when we're out in public with regard to distancing and face coverings and so forth. Uh, because once we go into our buildings, we don't want a situation where we're forced back out. We have just begun this conversation. We have so much more to touch on. I want to remind everyone watching this at home. We are taking your questions on our website. There was a live chat feature. Go to KSAT.com, submit those questions. We'll ask them. We'll get your answers. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Learning during a pandemic. We know that right now schools will begin with remote only for the first several weeks for several local school districts here in the San Antonio area. We're joined by two superintendents this evening, Pedro Martinez from SAISD, Dr. Brian Woods with Northside ISD. You both have been very frequent in your messaging with parents about what they should expect about what's to come with this upcoming school year. You've also talked about what you learned from the spring when everyone was forced to go remote overnight essentially uh, i want to ask you both and i'll start with you mr martinez what did you learn from the spring what worked what didn't and how is that shaping uh, what's going to be remote learning for the start of this school year we, le we learned a lot uh, first of all we did surveys and we got very favorable ratings from our teachers and from our parents uh, but one of the things that we saw was that uh, even though many of our students were doing well we did see many students that struggled uh, it was very frustrating for our teachers because as the students were struggling, our, our buildings were closed, we could not bring them in. Uh, we distributed 42,000 devices, uh, and that was uh, after over distributing more than four or 5,000 devices before pre-COVID. And so that was almost our entire district. Again, it was very difficult because our buildings were closed. And so what we've learned is that we need our buildings that are open, even though uh, instruction will be remote. Uh, we have a very strong uh, system called Canvas, it's the same system that students will use in college. More than 40% uh, of our, our high school students now are in college bearing courses or do credit courses. So we want to make sure that, that uh, we wanted to make sure they were used to that kind of system. So what our students are going to see is much more, uh, a much more structured schedule, a lot more synchronous time with teachers, uh, more rigor. But also what we learned is we have to provide a lot of support for families. So for example, we're providing training to our parents starting on this Thursday, this week, that will go through next Thursday, including this Saturday, and, and we'll continue those courses both in the morning and in the evening for parents so that they can feel more comfortable with our application. So that was one of the other lessons we learned is that many parents struggled in helping their, their children in getting on our, our applications.
And Dr. Woods, how about you? How has remote learning in the spring uh, now shaped what's going to be happening for the first few weeks of this fall? Yeah, so what? What? Um, I, it's a it's a good question. I think we all learned somewhat similar things. Uh, we learned that we needed a much more robust electronic system, both for teachers and students to access, um, and and that'll be in place uh, certainly uh, in the fall. Um, we also learned to, uh, and I want to echo what what Pedro said that schedules will be much more um, much more strict much more organized and much more synchronous time uh, with teachers with still the ability to have small group and one-on-one -on -one time with teachers if if uh, as needed and if appropriate so uh, so i think that we definitely learned that those things needed to be shored up uh, in the spring uh, and i think that our families will see that uh, in the in the fall the other thing that we learned, uh, or perhaps didn't learn, but were reminded of, was the uh, the incredible food insecurity that exists in parts of our community, and our need to uh, really uh, respond to that and address that, and and that has continued since March and will continue well into the new school year. Yeah, right. That's something that's not changing. Uh, it, that you're still providing food for families that need it. I appreciate that. All right, like I said, we have a live chat component tonight in what we're doing up until eight o'clock. And we're going to take our first question from that live chat off ksat.com after the break. With me, I'm going to keep all my kids home um, only because I don't, again, like I said, I don't want to just send two of them and then the other two stay here and think that it's still going to be safe because if my if I send two kids to school and you know they can always come home and give it to my other two kids or to me or my husband um so as of right now I think I would keep all my kids I want to thank Melanie for sharing her thoughts with us and that's a it's a decision that a lot of parents out there are having to make when schools reopen, do I send my kids in person or do I continue with the remote learning? As a matter of fact, the first viewer question we have off the live chat tonight is from Netta. And she asks the superintendents, will students be locked into whichever type of learning they pick for the entire year? Dr. Woods from Northside, I'll start with you. The answer is no. Uh, and there's both state guidance on that and, and local uh, rules as well. But the answer is no. Um, if a family decides that they want to start the year in distance learning, we will ask them to stay in that mode for a grading period. But towards the end of the grading period, we'll send another survey and ask if they've changed their mind. And if they have, then we'll uh, certainly make place for them uh, in the building, assuming the the public health metrics allow for uh, allow for it. But but the answer to the question is no. Families will uh, will have some some choice, and we want to maximize that choice. Uh, I think every superintendent I've talked to would tell you that, um, uh, and and they'll have choices throughout the year. Uh, Mr. Martinez, your your answer to this question. I mean, are we talking three weeks, four weeks that you're locked in at the most on some of these decisions? Uh, so there'll be nine weeks, and so but one of the things that I I, I want our parents to know. So even, even when we bring in children in person, and this is when Metro Health, uh, right now we're in the red, so everybody has to be virtual. When we go into the yellow uh, with their health metrics, we will start bringing in children in very small percentages, up to 25%. That, that means a limit of four to six children per classroom, and we're gonna do it gradually. And of course, always with parents' consent. And so, so even for, for children that are kind of gonna come in person, when uh, medical conditions allow, they'll come in gradually, slowly in person. What we want is families to come into our buildings to see our procedures, see our PPNE, make sure that they're comfortable with all the requirements we're gonna have. We're gonna ask them questions like, are you, is, will your child be able to keep a mask on all day? Uh, are you gonna support us in making sure that procedures are washing hands every hour, uh, you know, are gonna, that your child will support that? And so we wanna make sure parents just know exactly what we're doing. And then of course, you know, every, as, as Dr. Wood said, every nine weeks, families will get a chance to choose to stay remote, to go in person. And again, if medical conditions allow, we will do that. But it's going to be very, very gradual. All right. A lot more questions from our viewers coming into our website right now. We will get to those after this break. 
Welcome back to our town hall learning during a pandemic. We are taking your questions live on KSAT.com right now. We have a question for you, Dr. Woods in Northside ISD. This question is from Daniel. It says it looks like the schedules you are proposing for virtual learning look a lot like regular school schedules. What about parents who are working from home or have to take care of smaller kids or grandparents? They can't sit with their kids from eight to three every day. Are you going to penalize students who can't meet that demand because parents have to work too. Yeah, so the so the way we've thought about today, and this goes to some of the way we were answering a, an earlier question, what is that there will be periods of synchronous check-in where students can get direct instruction from the teacher. So the, the parent won't have direct instruction responsibilities. The teacher will be teaching the student and then when the synchronous period or the direct instruction ends, the student can go and do some work um, offline, if you will, much like they would have done uh, in a regular classroom setting. And then if needed, can check back in with the teacher for a one-on-one -on -one or with a small group. Perhaps they need a little reading assistance. Perhaps they need some enrichment. They need to be pushed a little further. Uh, that can happen in that kind of asynchronous or, or not online time. So I, I do think that parents are who, who need to work, and obviously that is a huge number of parents in uh, in our districts, uh, that it is going to be a it is going to be doable uh, in that way, and that parents will have a schedule that they can count on each day, uh, and it won't be different day to day or week to week. Doctor, I mean, Mr. Martinez, is this kind of the same with you when you talk about flexibility uh, uh, flexibility with parents in mind as well as students? Correct. Yes, yes. And so, you know, the only thing I would add is that for younger children, er every child will have synchronous time, which is live time with teachers, uh, and it'll grow as the, ch the children are older. So, for example, um, we, you know, we were just having a community meeting in the Sam Houston area, and we were showing the Sam Houston schedules. And the one thing that I really appreciated about what our principal did is they made the schedule to be similar to when children come in person. So in other words, remotely, the child will have 45 minutes in each class that is with the teacher, 45 minutes working on their own. Uh, we call it asynchronous time and they'll have, and it's an AB schedule. They have four courses on Mondays, another four courses on Tuesday. And so it's manageable and there's lunchtime schedules, uh, there's breaks in between. And so for younger children, there's, there's gonna be even more independent time. Yeah. So. So for us, you know, the, the key is just making sure fam the children have a structure. Because right, flexibility then, and structure so much yes, of, of what we're talking yes, about. Sir. We gotta get a quick break in, we'll be right back. Interesting too. All right, we have about 20 seconds left in this segment of the show. Not enough time to get a question in, but enough time to show you the esteemed panelists that we have, the six guests that we will have for part of our town hall. Unfortunately, Dr. Woods has a previous engagement and can't be with us, but we'll continue the conversation